Lindsay Williams, David Shapiro, George Gillis, what a week. We sort of counterbalance that and we've had good PMI data recently, which is more recent because it's on a monthly basis rather than a quarterly basis. And we've also had business confidence and also consumer confidence. So on the one side, in the short term, we've had a stabilization of economic data in South Africa. Uh, what is your interpretation of everything that's been thrown at us in the last couple of weeks? I mean, so the GDP number, the way we interpret GDP is, um, believe it or not, we don't pay as much attention to it as many people think we should, um, primarily because it's, it's so out of date. I mean, we're talking about Q2, and we're already well on our way through Q3. So, I mean, it's interesting that uh, we fell by, you know, 17 odd percent uh, year on year, but... Um, well, I mean, to, to be quite honest with you, I was actually quite impressed. I thought the number would be even worse than that, mm. uh, given the, the, the level of stringency that we got. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, try and, we, we try and focus more on the, the more forward-looking stuff. And so you're quite right. I mean, things like the PMI, um, the business confidence type stuff that we've seen, um, interestingly, is of, of greater significance and importance to me because it gives us a sense of what the, the economic recovery or at least the shape of it's going to look like. And yes, we're bouncing back, but it looks like it's going to be you know, one characterized by fits and starts, if you like. David, I, I want to bring you in here. How much attention do you pay to the overall GDP number? This is something we've discussed for many, many, many years, uh, way in from a market perspective. Yeah. Well, the reason is that I don't even understand what GDP means. You know, I'm an accountant, so uh, when you start throwing all kinds of economic terms at me, it just baffles me. You know, I understand that this is our growth uh, trajectory, but I don't think it makes so much. You know, I've always told Lindsay that uh, I go through, I, I look at results. I go to the numbers because you get a much better sense of where an economy is. Uh, if you if you read what uh, uh, CEOs or business leaders are to are saying about the economy and where growth is and what their outlook is, so uh, yes, I'm a bit cynical on GDP. I mean, I did do economics to at varsity, um, so it, it equips me to understand some. But we used to call it GNP. That's uh, that's how old I am. But but Bronwyn, it's that's where that's where we get a sense. And 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 if I could just come in on that side of it. It's very difficult to understand where this economy is going to from the outlook statements. And we, we're coming to the end of that of the June quarter. So we've got a lot of data around which we can make uh, views, but uh, there's, there's no clear sight of uh, when we're going to get out of this and, and, a, and also how much deeper we can get into it. So there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. So, Lindsay, I've spoken to, and I know you've spoken to a number of CEOs this week, but Hilly Mayer from Momentum Metropolitan, Jacques Silliers from FNB, Paul Hanratty from Sunlum. I know you're going to add to that list. Everybody, in my opinion, looking beyond COVID-19. Nobody's even focusing on the numbers that are coming out right now. Are you seeing a similar trend? Well, I, saw, I spoke to Stephen Sard, and he's a, diff, a, a different um, a, a, a different case because 86% of Aspen's numbers come from uh, beyond South Africa's borders. Uh, but uh, what I did get from, from the, the, the people I have spoken to is, the, is my uh, informal CE-ometer, uh, which is when you can hear, I mean, you and I, Bronwyn, have been on uh, broadcasting for many, many years, far too many than I care to mention. But I get a sense of what the mood is when you speak to the CEO. And certainly Stephen Saad was very upbeat, whether that's re a reflection of the South African economy, the global economy, I don't know, or the fact that he might get a lot of income from a potential vaccine production in, in the future. Uh, but, but yes, and I'll go back to David on this one, because David, on Wednesday, we had this massive rally in mm. South African domestic mm. stocks. We had the banks and the retailers all going through the roof. I mean, not two, three percent, but five, six, seven, up to 12 percent in certain cases. What was that all about? Does that tell you that the, the economy has now bottomed and we're looking forward uh, 12, 18 months hence for better times? Probably prices are bottom. Okay. In other words, share prices are bottom. But that doesn't mean the economy or the results are bottom. So you can find this kind of sideways drift for a long time. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're just going, uh, it, it's, it's quite extensive. There's about a 10% 
uh, movement up and down. And all we're doing is just going uh, sideways. And we reach a certain level, and then there's not enough penetration, and we fall back to the to the lower levels as well. So I'm to you know to put it into context i'm watching those uh the share price performance because you get a lot of you get a lot of um comfort from where people are putting their money or guidance from where people are putting their money and i don't see the turn yet um what 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 we're looking for is you know to see where we are you know i always tell you i like to look three four five years hence and i think I, maybe, uh, you know, George has a better idea of it because I've been asking these questions. I looked at First Rand yesterday and I saw the horrendous amount of money that they had to set aside um, for provisions. I'm saying, is this real? You know, in other words, is this a realistic account of what the economy is facing or is this just accountants playing games, you know, with various ifrises and something like this? And Lindsay, to me, that's, that's the answer. If those numbers that they are putting aside for bad debts or non-performing debts or non-performing loans, if those are real, then we're going to find some serious issues, uh, you know, down the line. So, George, let's, let, let's pick up on that note because uh, David is throwing it to you. And uh, this must be a data point that you focus in on. Impairments, bad debts gives you a sense of the health of the economy. How bad is it? Yeah, absolutely, Bronwyn. And I think um, it's actually weirdly encouraging for me to hear that uh, some companies are taking those steps because I think it builds the resilience of those, those companies and actually help build the resilience of the country more generally. Um, but, but in answer to uh, what, what David was talking about, I think it's, we are worried. We're very concerned about the fiscal state of play. Um, that's what keeps me up at night. It's the big elephant in the room that hasn't yet been tackled. Uh, mm -hmm. South Africa can bounce out of this really, really well, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if we get some deep-seated, prudent, constructive, growth-positive reforms that get implemented. Uh, they're ideologically very opposed to where the ANC sits right now, but you if, if you push hard enough uh, down that road, I think you can get a, a sustained longer term uh, economic recovery. If we don't go far enough down that reform path, um, I mean, it's, it's becoming a little bit trite to talk about it, but we, you know, we, we do view the possibility of heading down an IMF bailout. Um, and we do see a very, very long, hard slog to recover with, with some of the, the forecasts doing the rounds out there ours included, uh, being for a sort of a five-year recovery um, before we get to pre-COVID levels. Now, th that gives you a sense of just how sluggish things are, um, just what kind of headwinds we're facing. Remember, it's not just about recovering from COVID. We're trying to recover from COVID amid an electricity shortage, as well as structural deficiencies that have been in the making for at least the past decade. So there's a lot to overcome. Now's the time to implement the reforms. You implement the reforms, you'll get a very strong, uh, a, a positive future for South Africa. Failing that, I, I think these companies are, are very prudent um, to, to be taking the positions that they're taking because it's not looking good out there. And, and we are expecting a big, strong tick up in non-performing loans and liquidations. They typically come with a lag. So you, you'll probably see those coming through very strongly towards the end of this year and beginning of next. So we've still got a ways to go before we can call this a stabilized environment. We've only just become, uh, just begun the recovery. It's interesting, isn't it, David, what George has just said. Um, companies are being prudent, but is government being prudent? That, that's the thing. I, I, again, I, I talked last week about the, the mall economy and the, the JSC economy, but the prudence must surely go across all levels of South African uh, society and uh, starting with government it must start at the top sure huh. but it's no, not I, I, don't get me on this i'll lose any chance that you have of getting a sponsor you know so it's it, it's best i hold my tongue but you know lindsay i want to say that that globally i've been disappointed with government over the whole treatment of COVID. globally there has been no you know i, I think we were talking last night we closed we closed our borders, we've closed cities, we've closed suburbs, we've closed even our buildings. 
and and yet nobody has taken care of this. Uh, no one has bothered to have a, a conference, a UN conference, an international, a G7, G8, G20, you name it, and sit around and say, how are we going to address this, this particular issue? There's absolutely no leader who has come out on top as a as a, as someone that you can look to to help us get through this? But coming back to that, you know, I think what George says this this was happening before COVID hit us, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm very cautious and I'm very very nervous that that even though we're stabilising and that even markets are giving a view that things are improving, we're very very far from from getting to where we want to. And those structural reforms are just so, you know, it, it goes across all industries. It just, it just covers every one of the industries here. And we've got the means. You know, this is a country that is blessed with so many elements to actually make it work. The only thing that's missing is the human factor or the government factor in actually getting us there. So, you know, what George says is, is, is imperative. And Moody say that, IMF say it. Everybody tells us we all we all hear the message, but no one listens. You know, there's yeah. no one, no one listening. Oh no, we'll do it. You know, trust me. Tr you know, those are the worst words anybody can ever say is trust me. That's the last thing you do is trust someone who says trust me. Anyway, David, let's let's look at these the the numbers. We've got a flurry of results, as Lindsay and I were alluding yeah. to, as you were alluding to earlier, and, yeah. you, and you referred to the bad debts being a big concern for you, uh, Stephen Saad. He was upbeat. And uh, do you think that uh, the market was disappointed? There was no dividend, um, which possibly in this environment is also the prudent thing to do. They last paid a dividend in, in uh, October 2018. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the market was uh, over expecting, um, well, the, the expectations were overly high for Aspen because they did come in, they put out a trading update, and yet the, the stock fell? You, you know what Stephen's got to do now? He's got to rebuild his credibility. By credibility, I don't mean that we, you know, he's a really good, nice man. I've got nothing against him personally, but we've lost our way. You know, <laughs> I, I said to our, to our analyst, Alec Abraham, this morning, you know, just discussing, I said, Alec, do me a favor, give me an anagram of, of uh, or, sorry, uh, uh, organogram, an anagram, an organogram <laughs> of, 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 of what the company does. I, you know, I've lost track. There's so many deals and so many sales and so much corporate movement that I've lost touch about where they are and where they're going to make their money. Once we know what those channels are, we can start to look ahead and monitor them on, on those channels. They've done a lot to get their debt down, which they, you know, and they, they, um, they got huge debt as they started to acquire different companies and went in. They thought the world was never going to end. This is a party time, you know, when they did all those deals. So I think from Stephen's point of view, he's got to build that credibility again and show, okay, listen, we've let you down the last few years. We know where we're going as well. But he's got the mechanisms. He's got the he's got the product. Now start delivering. You know what I mean? <laughs> start delivering you, and we'll be rewarded. David, if you go to strictlybusinesspodcast.com, sorry, Bronwyn, to, to give my uh, site a punt, but I had a great interview with uh, Stephen yesterday. I know you spoke to him as well, but he does explain it very well. George, I want to talk to you about something. Yeah, yeah, I, I sit in Rotterdam. And I can look, I can look with, with an indulgent eye at what's happening in, in, in South Africa. And I saw the click story this week, and it's sort of symptomatic of what South Africa is all about. Social media flagged the fact that, that the clicks was going to be attacked by a certain political party and would be the subject of, um, subjected to, to thuggery, uh, George. And doesn't that say something that the piece were not posted? At, at, at click stores. What is the ANC doing? Surely the ANC would benefit from, from, from actually discrediting this particular party and, and showing the rule of law was in force. I, I, I looked at that and I thought, goodness me, sometimes I miss South Africa a lot, but sometimes I don't. George, what do you think of the click story? If you're allowed yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't think much of the click story, to be honest with you. I mean, the, the way we the way we tend to to look at these things is um, as a company, we we try and monitor the amount of uh, instances of um, of uh, social upheaval, whether that be um, protests, riots, violence, that sort of thing. So so we keep tabs on that and. 
And we try and monitor that as it ebbs and flows through, through an economic cycle. And uh, we're in a classic period at the moment where, the, where there's a, a tremendous amount of frustration boiling over in all aspects of society. So I think if you just pull back the lens a little bit, Lindsay, and you, and you look at this as objectively as possible, what you'll tend to find is that um, oftentimes uh, these periods where you've got the, this kind of uh, social angst, if you, if you like, that, that creeps into all sorts of, of, of behavior that we don't want to see, it tends to coincide with periods of economic distress. The higher the level of distress, the more disgruntled a, a society becomes. And so it, it starts to manifest in, in all sorts of, of behavior like this. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not a political analyst and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer your, your questions uh, perhaps as directly as you'd like, but I can answer it from my perspective to just say that if you want to deal with these sorts of issues um, on a sustained and fundamental basis, you really do have to address uh, the basic problem of unemployment. You've got to address the inability of people to earn a living. Uh, you've got to address uh, the inability of government to service communities that are underprivileged and already struggling. Um, so there's a lot to this. There's many, many facets to this. And, and I think this is a classic case of boiling over. I mean, if you think internationally, I think back to, to uh, examples like the Arab Spring um, that, that, uh, that took place, which was a seminal moment um, in, in, the, in the Middle East. You think to uh, Brexit and, and how that's unfolded. Uh, you think to uh, the Yellow Vest Brigade in France and how that's unfolded and the politics that have unfolded in Italy. It's not just a function of South Africa. South Africa's got its own flavor to all of this, if you like. But th there's a lot going on globally. Um, in South Africa's case, it's perhaps a little more pronounced because of, of the depth of, of despair that we're feeling in this country at the moment. But, you know, that doesn't need to detract from the criminality involved in all of this. I mean, I, I have got no time for, for that, that kind of response. Uh, political response. I've got no time for it whatsoever. There's, there's always time for, for discussion and, and debate, and there's a legal process that can be utilized to tackle companies that do, do things poorly. But um, yeah, I think there's a bigger issue at stake here, and it's the one that I've just outlined. So David, mm -hmm. uh, anything on the results stand out this week? Because again, um, you know, you've been looking think, for data points. I, I like ShopRite. I think why and why, why, why do I like ShopRite? And I think you can put Fajini in the same category as well. The one thing that's going to come out of this lockdown is that companies are going to have to revisit their business models. They're not going to come out the same way as they went in. And what I like about ShopRite is that they've adapted their business model and their whole business plan to what's happening now. And that's going to put them ahead of everybody. The 60-60, which I haven't used because I've got a, I've got a wonderful uh, checkers just down the road together with the Woolworths, together with a uh, disc game, you know, literally within a kilometer of where I am and that. But you can see the change in the business. You know, you can see checkers. You remember checkers was always at the low end of the market. Suddenly, hold on a sec, they're not too bad, you know. Um, you can get what you want and this delivery service coming within an hour of, of your order is great. You know, threatening, challenging thrups, which is three times the price, you know, so uh, you can get your, you can get things there as well. Thrups are great. I've got nothing against them. Um, but I, that, that, to me, the way that, that checkers are rebranding themselves and also the courage to move out of Nigeria, the courage to move out of Kenya and say, hold on a sec, Africa's not really for us. We can't get the property. We can't make money. This is where we're going to focus. So I think credit to them for the way that they're handling where they are at the moment. Do we have an elephant in the room? Uh, is it still the U.S. election? Where is that? Uh, I've forgotten the name of your pink. Pink elephant. Um, well, I was actually told the other day I'm not allowed to call it a male elephant, so I'm now calling it an LGBTQ elephant. She's got the mask on. And it, the, the mask is on because of, of what's happening in Europe at the moment, Bromen, um, because there is a spike in cases. And we've only just got, a, a, it's a nice day today, it's nice and sunny. If I look up there, I can see a bit of blue sky. 
uh, but uh, when winter comes and uh, the Dutch and the Belgians and the French and everybody uh, get into, into bars and things, there's going to be a spike. So unfortunately, it's very corny and not very original, but the coronavirus will, I think, have a second or third wave, whatever it is. I don't know what you two chaps think about it, but I'm very, very worried. And I'm actually starting to get uh, mentally affected by this now, um, becoming an agrophobe, ag agrophobe, and I won't go out without a mask. I don't know about mm -hmm. you, but anyway, the, the Bronwyn to answer, coronavirus resurgence is my elephant pink and elephant. we need we need to get your view so george let's before we close out resurgence of coronavirus scenario planning around that and then dave if you can follow yeah i mean i think um <clears throat> dave david alluded to it a little bit earlier i think this whole pandemic has been handled extremely badly um i think the communication around it was poor i think they they say that they're utilizing data and science to drive decision making, but uh, we've been involved, DTM's been involved in, in um, an, an effort to try and bring some sanity to the discussion domestically. And I, I can tell you that it doesn't appear to me like science and data was necessarily followed particularly well at all. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a lot to be said about uh, having segregated populations a little bit more um, in, in the sense that we should have focused on the vulnerable, not focused on the entire economy the way that we did. Um, so, so there's a lot, there are a lot of lessons to be learned out of this. Um, uh, there's still a ways to go. Unfortunately, these infections are still happening. The positive, if there is a, an upside to all of this, is that the death rates have come down dramatically. So, so this isn't the crisis that it was when it first broke. Um, and, and so as a result of that, I, I don't see us going back into sort of full lockdown mode and, and all of that. There might be pockets of it, but not on a broad scale. Um, but it stands in the way of a full-blown economic recovery, and we've got a plan around that. It's going to be still a challenging uh, months ahead until a, a vaccine comes out and people can calm down and, and we surmount this thing and start treating it like the flu going going forward, but there's a ways to go, unfortunately. And so, you know, 2020 still has some speed bumps ahead. Oh. <laughs> just, Bronwyn, to, to give you some idea of where we are, just remember today's 9-11. It's 19 years since, uh, since the World Trade Centers, uh, you know, t since that happened. But I think to put it in perspective, this week is Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year. And as long as I can remember, and I'm, I'm turning 73 in November, I have never missed uh, a Seder, you know, where the family gets together and you celebrate the new year, you know, followed by the fast. And for all intents and purposes, it's, it's almost been cancelled. You know, the, the synagogues don't know how to handle it. They're allowed to have 50 people for two hours for services that go on. So it, it, it kind of brings it into perspective. You know, Rosh Hashanah's cancelled. I don't know what we're going to do about Christmas. If Lindsay's got his way, or if this happens and unfolds, you're going to see Christmas cancelled as well. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's rather a sad note that we've come down to, to that. But uh, nothing we can do, and just, just allow it to work its way through the system, which it will do. You know, it will do. Are we ending these shows on such a somber note every time? We've got to change up the no, game. Wait, but anyway, no, no, here sorry, we go sorry. again. Happy uh, days. It's the weekend. The positive note is that the English Premier League starts tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Arsenal so, Fulham. Dude, yeah, Arsenal Fulham, the lunchtime kickoff. I promise yeah. you. I won't just sleep tonight. I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, George, we, we've got to get in the game here. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Lindsay Williams, David Shapiro, George Glynis. What a week. It's been a pleasure.